Shukran Omar, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody, Salamat. It's such an uh, honor to be here today in conversation with an amazing artist like Vera Tamari and having also amazing audiences like yourselves and a lot of familiar faces. So thank you for having me. And I'm really, really honored to be here, Vera, to be in discussion and conversation with such a prominent and notable Palestinian artist like yourself. Uh, somebody who's been really leaving a valuable imprint on Palestinian art movement as an artist, as an activist, as a feminist, as an educator, as a curator, you name it. But also I have a special relationship with Vera as a friend and she also was my tutor uh, 20 years ago or so. I'm not going to count uh, numbers now, but if there is somebody who taught me something in life and a start in my career that was Vera. So I feel here that I will never give you justice to be in conversation with you. And uh, But I'm very honored and I hope, uh, and I'm sure today will be very enjoyable to get to unpack what we're discussing. Uh, it, of course, having an event such this event um, in such a difficult time also in Palestine, as mentioned by Omar and friends of Birzeit, who we thank today for having us, is I think is really critically important because it's exactly really a testament that within such a culture of power that is being imposed by an Israeli occupation, it's really that culture of art, literature, and uh, uh, education that, and creativity that really is going to defy this culture of power. So today is really very timely event to discuss Vera's work and the great initiative that she's been doing throughout the years. Vera, uh, welcome. Very honored to be in discussion with you. Uh, I really, there are so many different ways to introduce you, Vera. And I felt maybe to give you justice and maybe also to narrate you in a different way. I thought maybe we can, you can introduce us to yourself or tell us a little bit more about you through the cities that have shaped you. So what would you tell us about you in relation to Yafa, Ramallah, Jerusalem and Beirut? What do they mean to you and how did this make the Vera that we know today? Yara, that's a very nice question and a nice approach to your our discussion. But first, I would like to thank FOBZU and uh, Friends of Birzit University in London and all the people who were uh, Omar and all the team who are and Donna and all the team who are uh, have been working very hard to promote uh, culture and the Birzit University culture in the UK and abroad. And I feel very proud to be, to have been invited and feel honored again to have been invited to partake in, in this um, webinar uh, to talk about my, my art, my involvement with Birzeit, my involvement as an artist, as a teacher. And uh, the, the other thing that I would like to mention very, very strongly is my special relationship with this young lady, uh, uh, Yara, who was my student, architecture student at Birzeit University. And for two years, I had her in different courses. And I remember she was a very intelligent student who gave me some trouble with her questions often. So mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I felt, I, fe I feel that seeing how Yara has evolved in her career in, in, in the, in, as a professor and as an architect and as a researcher, is, is a, a wonderful thing. And thank you, Yara, for accepting to be my conversant tonight. It's Going back to your question, uh, yes, uh, the many places that have affected my life, uh, uh, I, can, I can mention them briefly. I mean, uh, uh, Jaffa, Jaffa is a, the, the, the town of my parents, my family. They originated from Jaffa. Uh, the Tamari and the Debas family were originally from Jaffa. Uh, and to this city, I have a special uh, connection and connectivity because of the memory of their being there and being brought up in that uh, city throughout their childhood and adulthood. Unfortunately, I wasn't brought up there, but on my few visits to Jaffa, I could tell 
the kind of link and affection my parents had for that city, the, the sea city of Jaffa, Arus and Bahr, the bride of the sea, as it's called. Uh, Jerusalem is the place where I was born. Uh, I was born in 1945 in Jerusalem in the Mascobie Hospital, which is now, unfortunately, it, it used to be a Russian compound hospital, and it now is a, um, a detention cent center, unfortunately. I mean, uh, to think that I was born in a hospital which has become a detention center is a bit uh, sad for me to foresee. Um, Ramallah, I was brought up in Ramallah. My parents moved to Ramallah before 1948, as my father had a job with the British mandate in Jerusalem, and he took up a residence in, in Elbire, a twin city to Ramallah. That's where I, I grew up. And uh, Jerusalem is the place where, uh, where, I, where, where I was born, but also the place where I studied in high school and developed a strong attachment to that city. Uh, I studied at a nuns school. I was a boarding student there. And Beirut is where I did my first degree in, in the arts, a city that was very inspiring culturally for, for me and my brother and sister who also studied there. So these are the cities I would, would mention also Florence and Oxford where I continued my education. In Florence, I did ceramics uh, diploma in, 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 in practical ceramics. And at Oxford University, I did a degree, in, an MPhil degree in Islamic art and architecture with focus on ceramics, on Islamic ceramics. So these, these are the cities that shaped me and shaped my career. They shaped me as a person, and they shaped my career. That's amazing, Vera. And obviously, you also come from a very special, prominent, unique family, which I see a few of them here, which is very nice. And I'm sure also the background of your family have, uh, it has very much shaped you. So I wanted to really ask about uh, what influenced really your art and career, which you've noted a bit from the cities that you were born. And I just wanted to tell the audience, as Vera is talking, we may be sharing some uh, slides. So please bear with us with the technology. Of course, we would have loved if we were all face to face. So we will be going back and forth with the screen. So Vera, if you could kindly tell us a little bit more about uh, what influenced really your art and your uh, career. And obviously, Yafa yeah, and the city, but I imagine family would have played a key role. And as Definitely. you know, as you're speaking, I'm going to share a screen. Please go ahead. Def definitely. I mean, uh, uh, the influence of my, my parents uh, in, uh, has been enormous on the three of us, Tanya, my, my eldest sister, Vladimir, my brother, my late brother, Vladimir, and myself. We all somehow got involved in the arts and culture because of my parents' influence and because of my parents' encouragement and all the time giving us opportunities to learn and to grow culturally and not only culturally I mean they also gave us a lot of uh, input in, in how to be human beings and to to uh, to appreciate and and to to uh, to grow within the environment that we are in to be aware of our environment and to love our environment. So Faye and Margot were great lovers of nature. They were great lovers of art. My mother, very briefly, my mother, as when she finished her high school from a nun school in Jerusalem, went to Jaffa and established a, a small atelier in her house. And she enrolled with a with a with a course, a correspondence course with Paris. In that you can imagine in the twenties, a young woman from Jaffa uh, doing an art course with a, a Ecole Abyssé in, in France. And so she had a very strong uh, uh, interest in the art. I mean, had she had the opportunity, she would have been a great, great artist. Unfortunately, she never practiced her art, but she practiced her art through us, through giving us advice and always appreciating our work or discussing our work. She was an amazing person with a lot of insight. My father, Fayek, loved the arts. He also loved music. He had a lot of uh, um, interest in, 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 in giving us opportunity to, to learn and to study and to, to get a, higher, a good education. 
And uh, the outcome was that uh, my brother Vladimir, uh, my late brother, uh, he became a very prominent art artist, painter, and he, he, unfortunately he lived away from Palestine because he was almost deported and not allowed to come back to, to, to live with us. So he lived in Japan for, 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 for maybe 45 years or more in Tokyo. And, that, and he was an inventor as well. His background in physics helped him to create some inventions related to optics. I don't want to talk too much about family. Tanya is a great uh, classical singer and um, she, she uh, sings to songs by famous uh, poets like Darwish, Kamal Nasser, uh, and composed by uh, her, her sister-in-law, Rima Tarasi. So she has a nice repertoire of music. So this is our family. And we all supported each other's art. I mean, I, mean, I would spend hours with my brother talking about the different things we created. So it was a, a lovely in, encouragement. Very beautiful photos of the family. Yes. And, and you mentioned Yafa earlier in the discussion. So this is Yafa, the seashore that I never experienced. I mean, I come from a sea city, but I have never experienced uh, the, the sea except for very few visits with my parents after we were allowed after mm. 1967 to mm. go and visit. And it was a very moving experience for me to realize what a beautiful city they must have had, what a beautiful and rich life they had. It was a cultural city. It had, it had a beautiful location in the sea. Uh, it was, it had full of uh, Jaffa, you know, I don't want to talk too much about Jaffa because it was the hub, the hub of culture in Palestine, where there were cinemas and theater and, and concerts and music, etc. Uh, to in Jaffa, I mean, I, I have a very special relationship with Jaffa and the sea, and I made an artwork, um, Oracles from the Sea, uh, which is to honor my, my ancestors from Jaffa. I made a series, these are just a few of the bigger installation that I took to Jaffa itself and planted them on the seashore. This is the, the Jaffa seashore. So these are the faces of my ancestors. They're classical. They don't remember, resemble anybody from the family, but they are people who witness and who come out of the sea to talk and look in, at Jaffa, look towards Jaffa and tell about the stories that have happened in Jaffa, the, the, the stories of life, of loss, mm. of, of, of the tragedy that befell the, the people. And, and uh, so it's, it, is, it, it catches a lot of memory. I call this mm. oracles from the sea. They're telling about the future as well. Mm. Uh, I, find it, I found it very moving when I put the, the heads, the, the masks or the heads on these stands in, this, in the sand because they were moving with the, with the wind. And as if they were talking, and uh, you could see from behind their eyes the waves also moving, and and so it it was a very emotional experience when I did that in in Jaffa. Very beautiful. And then this is Ramallah, which obviously the childhood and also the career, the teaching career. So tell us a bit more about Ramallah, the landscape and the city. The landscape has always been as family. Uh, a very precious thing that we held. We would go every 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 spring as a family or several families with my uncle as well and his family mm -hmm. to the hills near Ramallah on the road to Nablus and pick up the, the spring flowers and jump from one terrace to another. So our link with the landscape is very vivid and very true. Mm -hmm. uh, we got to know and love this landscape so much. And seeing this landscape now being usurped, being destroyed, being uh, taken away. On each hilltop, you have a, a colony and a settlement. Uh, you have the, the modern construction of, 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 of a squeezed Palestine. You have the hills being filled with buildings and buildings without any proper planning. It pains me a lot. And when I look at these hills, this is the hills I remember. It's a bit romantic, I mean, to mm. talk about it that way, but. This is the hills that I remember, and the olive tree is a special, mm. special meaning for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which later we'll talk about it a bit more. I mean, talk about yeah. the olive tree and how it's impacted. Yeah. And surely the village, the village. The village, the Palestinian village is another uh, very important um, uh, thing that I, I, I portrayed in, in my early work, especially in my early work. 
My, my experience with the village came as I was teaching. I will talk about it a little more later on. And mm -hmm. took my students from the teacher training center to do studies in different villages around uh, Ramallah and Nablus and uh, Hebron and uh, mm -hmm. all over. We went, it was like a project. Mm -hmm. And we, we, I came to love the, the, the village. That I am a city person. But I love the, the construction of the, the, the way, the organic way the, the houses were built on the hillside and the way uh, you would go meandering between the, the, the houses and the, and the trees and the hawakir, the fruit trees and fruit, fruit gardens and stuff like that. So I was very impressed. I'm always very impressed. But the village, unfortunately, is losing that original flavor, which is natural. It could lose with time, I mean, with the development. But it, again, it's being, it's, it's being lost because of, of also the, the penetration of, the, of mm. the settlements at the wall and the separation of the wall of these villages mm. that look so pastoral mm. in my mind as a child. So I made this uh, big wall um, mural uh, about the seasonal activities in the village. And my experience with the villagers is not an experience, romantic experience with the villagers. It's a true experience because I, I was with the villagers, with my students, mm. sat with them. I could feel them and, and understand the, the rhythm of their life as they went along with the daily chore or seasonal activities. So the mid, in the middle, there's a Palestinian village and around it are seasonal activities carried by women and men. Mm. in the village. So this also, I mean, I don't want, a lot of artists use the village as a theme, uh, uh, mostly in a romanticized way. Mm. I mean, in, in, because, because in, in, in the arts in Palestine, going to the roots, to the village, it's like going to the natives, to the, mm. to the, mm. the true, uh, the true, uh, the mm. true, um, persons that who, who, who represent Palestine and the land. So mm. it was, it's from that aspect, a lot of artists did a lot of work on, on Palestinian villages. Yes. Vera, may, may I ask you on this, did this trigger your use of clay as a medium, the life in the village? Because it feels like from these uh, uh, images that we're looking at, there seems to be a bit of a lot of hand, handcrafts. Did this trigger clay yes. as a medium? Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, my visits to the village, I mean, I was aware, I became aware of the ancestral crafts and traditions mm. and the culture that was carried by the men and women in the villages. Mm. And I, I found the clay as a medium, a very natural and organic way to shape and mm. mold these scenes. They came in very naturally. I felt uh, with me, I mean, I, I maybe I'm not as good in painting and drawing, but doing mm. clay reliefs came in very naturally and because it represented something that's also very organic and part of the close to the land and history yeah, yeah. what about archaeology vera where where did your passion to archaeology come from my my passion came even as a child mm. i remember my father taking me to a reception and i met um, I don't know her mind, this famous archaeologist uh, Never mind. Very mm. famous, the one who who dug up uh, Jericho, mm. Kathleen Kenyon. Kathleen Kenyon. I, she was an older woman and very sort of rough and and uh, you know and and my father told her Vera is very much interested in archaeology. As a little child, I was I thought I would like to go and dig and find things and so she in a way dissuaded me, but I continued because she said it's a very very bad a very difficult career. For a young woman of your age, mm. and you have to learn Latin, and you have to learn I don't know what not. So I, I, I was dissuaded from studying archaeology, but I continued my interest in archaeology. And when I first worked at Birzeit University, and was up in 1986, mm. I taught with the Professor um, L. Glock. I taught a course in in uh, the, the, the the pottery of Palestine. I, I was assistant to him in the course. So while doing that, I became aware of, of the, the different potteries that were mm. made in the land. And, and in fact, wherever we went out in nature, we would pick up pieces of shirts, 
everywhere you go in Palestine, it's so rich, it has been inhabited for thousands and thousands of years. You would find shirts representing different civilizations. And that stirred in me a, a very strong uh, will of, of including my experience with these shirts and including it in my reliefs of my sculptures, my ceramic sculptures. This is this is a piece called Rhythm of the Past. And I don't know if you, Yara, you can point to some of the shirts within the piece. Uh, yes, this and some of them are original shirts, uh, hmm. Byzantine, some are, are Bronze Age shirts. And what's amazing is that when I was visiting the, the village of Sinjil and I met uh, in Musa, the potter, who used to do this big jar, she was using exactly the same motifs that were mm. found in the Bronze Age pottery shirts around Palestine. So I included those uh, patterns within my, my work uh, because of the strong link and the continuity of the civilization being on the land. I mean, nice. although, although the Israelis would like to deny us this, uh, mm. this, this longevity of being part of this, this land, we are part of this land and this is a proof, this is history. So I use it in, in my sculptures, on my pots, I use these motifs to remind us of, of that continuity. On, on that uh, note of the occupation, Vera, uh, I mean, surely it's such a heavy baggage to carry and a responsibility as an artist and... Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it has, uh, I mean, already as you're talking, you're showing how much it has informed the way you're uh, addressing archaeology or the landscape or the way you're working. Uh, tell us a bit more. How, I mean, is it exhausting to work in a complex like Palestine with occupation? How did that impact your work? How did it influence it? Do you feel, is it limiting or is it enriching in a way? <sighs> It, it is something you cannot run away from. I mean, you're living in a, in a place where every day you, you read and see images of destruction, of appropriation, of, of, uh, of taking the rights of the people to live on the land. It's, it's a daily, daily, these images cannot, you cannot, they cannot escape you. You have, they, mm. they live with you. Mm. And I, I, I don't do this from a, a political and as a politician or just to claim that I would be nationalistic. I'm doing it because this is what I see and what I feel and I, what, what I live through. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember through the first, the second Intifada, the kind of destruction that took place around us, the, the destruction of streets like they're doing today in, in Jenin destruction of homes and land. Mm. And you see in, in the image on the right, you see uh, it's, it's an image of, of settlers using the land, the Palestinian land being protected by, by a soldier. They appropriate the land and they feel like it is theirs to, for keeps, you know, whereas the poor farmers who own this land are, are not allowed to go and, and um, uh, collect their crop or mm. to, to look after the land or to plow it. So it's it's a huge, it's a criminal thing I feel happening mm. to the land. I mean, it's, it's like murdering the land every day. You have these stories that are terrible and it's going on and on and it's becoming even more vicious lately. It has become more vicious with this drive to make many more colonies everywhere. They're sprouting like mushrooms all over. So this is a piece on the left-hand side I called it fragmented landscape. It is, it is, it is the fragmented landscape that we are witnessing these days. Mm. And I did it in uh, 1995, mm. so a, a long time ago. But it's ongoing. I mean, it's ongoing. I mean, even more, more uh, mm. dramatically. I feel that uh, there, there's been kind of a slight shift in your representation of in terms of art, especially when we talk about the occupation, probably the years or the ongoing occupation has to do with it. So this is a slightly kind of a strong shift in the way that you've been working. Can you tell us a bit more about this work? And if I may, I want to read something from Kamal Bullata that he wrote about this work before you talk about it. 
He said, it's, an, it's amazing how your creative work doesn't only operate as a mirror to a harsh political reality, but it's also a window overlooking constantly changing state that is being made part of the ongoing scene of havoc and destruction. Can you tell us a bit more about the context of this and why Kamal Bullato said this? Well, I mean, we're really confronted, like I say, with, with this violence against, against our environment, against ourselves, against the human beings. But I was struck during this, the incursion in Ramallah in 2002 by the amount of, of damage that, was, that the Israelis uh, deliberately made to, uh, to what the Palestinians held as precious and their own belongings. There were about 700 cars squashed like this in, in Ramallah only during mm -hmm. the incursions. And you could see them everywhere like cadavers, like, like, uh, like dead people sort of sprayed, sort of flattened on, on the floor. Ambulances, private cars, tr little trucks, whatever the, the tanks could go over, went over them. They went into their gardens. They, they, they destroyed the, 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 the gates of houses. They, they destroyed so much. I was very moved. I mean, I'm not a person who, I, I don't drive myself, but I felt like this depriving the people of their freedom of movement was something so deliberate and ugly that I made this, it's, it looks cute actually. I made, we, mm. I, I made the big installation. I shifted from my little miniature mm. uh, artworks in clay. And, and I did this installation uh, in the field of the French boy school grounds. And I made it in a place where uh, the top between the trees, there were, you can see it in the picture. There's the settlement of Psagot. I meant to show it, to show the settlers something that they, the, their army did uh, during the incursion. And in fact, they, they saw the, there was a comment in, in Haaretz once, they said, uh, although we have squashed and, and destroyed so many cars, yet there are still cars on the streets of Ramallah. Uh, they, they were very deliberate in doing this, this ugly, ugly act. Mm. It, it's, a, it's a sarcastic, I called it going for a ride as if these people are going on a ride with a family or whoever is going to be on a business or something like that. And I put music, music and radios in each of the, so there was a sound installation in each of the cars relaying um, either the news or music or um, a talk show, whatever, there was Quran. Um, and I hung these uh, Mm -hmm. little trinkets that you they hang for for uh, good luck on the cars little eye evil eye little beads mm -hmm. and stuff like that inside the cars unfortunately the the installation was destroyed redestroyed the next day there was an, another curfew imposed so not many people saw it except for the opening and the the tanks went into the field and redestroyed the, the, the cars again, they pushed them off the, the tarmac that I made in the, in the, in the field. And uh, so it, it, had a live, it, had the, it had a different life of its own mm -hmm. <laughs> reacting to this. So yeah, uh, this is the installation. It was a big installation and I, I, I felt a lot of people helped me, people from the municipality, people from, the, the Ministry of Works giving me big mm. winches to carry the cars from where they were and stuff like that. So sadly, that window overlooking the constantly changing landscape is constantly changing to a darker and narrower window in this case. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Vera, I wanted to, uh, before we talk about your art as a career, and I'm aware of time, so excuse me if, um, uh, I, I rush you a bit. Uh, you mentioned the village, you mentioned the landscape, you mentioned the impact of the tree. And we see here yet another also medium and another method of representation about this olive tree. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Very quickly. I know I'm, we're taking time on this. I think we should shift. This is an installation I also did in 2002. And it was a result of many uh, clippings that I cut from newspapers every day. 
about the number of trees that have been destroyed, olive trees that have been destroyed in the Palestinian countryside and destroying the people's livelihood because the villagers and the Palestinian peasant lives on the land and lives on traditionally on, on the crop of the olives and, and the olive oil that it produces. So they, they cut the olive trees, they uproot the olive trees. As you see this woman clinging to a tree, poor thing. It's very sad. I mean, the, I, I counted hundreds of thousands of olive trees that have been cut every, I mean, during that period. It wasn't one or two or hundred, it was so many. It, it left a lot of impact. So I made a, an installation in ceramics, these little, little uh, round things are small olive trees and I was doing them during the curfew. I would go down to the workshop and I start as a, it was therapeutic because I was doing every, doing a tree. I said, it's, I'm making the tree like a mantra for every olive tree that I have, that has been uprooted and destroyed. So I made hundreds of them. I mean, there are about 600. 50 trees and I put the picture of the Roman the, the, the mother mother tree that's protecting the land above uh, looking at these trees that are recreating themselves in so many colors and so it's like like the hope of continuity on the land hello shukran vera I'm gonna stop sharing and I am going to go back to um uh, asking you a bit more also about your uh, art as a career, and particularly, I wanted to return back to the, if I may, to the 70s uh, era. Uh, why the 70s? Because whenever I think of prominent Palestinian artists, I think of quite a few numbers, and it's nice to see also uh, today with us, uh, Samia Halabi, I can see her in the background, and I see many few amazing people here. But when I think about Vera Sliman Nabil, uh, there is kind of uh, something special that you've left, an imprint that you've left. But particularly, I wanted to talk about this um, initiative that you've created, which is what you've called a home, creating a home in Jerusalem for artists. Can you tell us a bit more about this and I why should, was it I significant? talk a little bit about very briefly that in the 70s, there was a very, very spontaneous drive to pick up from the occupation of the Israelis and do something to, mm. to, to, to maintain our dignity, to maintain our culture, to maintain. Mm. So a lot of things happened within the arts. Uh, the League of Palestinian Artists was formed and many young artists who were, had studied abroad came, came into Palestine and they, we formed a group. And what was being produced at the time was an, an art that was called committed art, an art to, that uh, uh, was in conversation with 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 the with the political situation, the art that was the art that showed yearning for freedom, for independence, mm. for for a good future, for uh, and a lot of symbols were created at the time. Yeah. Um, symbols of uh, that were used and reused like symbol of the dove, the dome of the rock, the woman, the woman as a symbol of, of uh, uh, fertility, the woman as a symbol of resistance. Uh, you see her in all the works of all the artists at the time. And it, it was a very, very lively movement and hundreds of people would come to our shows. Eventually, um, uh, there's a group of us, a small group uh, composed of Sliman, Mansour, Nabil Anani, Tasir Barakat, and myself. We decided to do, uh, we grouped ourselves and we, we decided to do something in Jerusalem, something for the arts and culture. We chose Jerusalem because we felt Jerusalem, we still could go and come to Jerusalem at the time. And we felt we needed to, to show our, the presence, the art presence in Jerusalem. So. Are you we did the Wasati Art Center. Oh. The Wasati Art Center was was made in an old home, an old house, beautiful house with a garden in Sheikh Jarrah, and we put a lot of effort to to make it into a very appealing and inviting place. And we held several very beautiful exhibitions. Although several times the Israeli army would come, the police in Jerusalem would come, and and stop us from the openings. And and there was a debate and. They would call on the artists, and so there is always this this thing with um, Jamil mm. in Jerusalem. So the Wasiti, we did stay on for many many years. We had wonderful exhibitions, and with the idea of bringing over Palestinian artists uh, 
who, who hadn't been to Palestine into Jerusalem. So we had the first exhibitions called From Exile to Jerusalem. It included works by Samia, Halabi, Kamal Bullata, Vladimir, mm-hmm. Samir Salame, mm-hmm. um, Jelana Husseini, mm-hmm. Leila Shawa, all these people who are brilliant artists living abroad were presented in this. And above all, it was Jabra Ibrahim Jabra who was in Iraq, the famous writer and artist. So we found some of his works in Bethlehem and there was the revelation, beautiful work. So we had, we had this, we made this house and we had a lot of activities in the house. Uh, eventually the, our group, the same group we formed, <laughs> we sort of mutinied against the, 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 the League of Palestinian Artists. I, I, it's not as bad as this, but we felt we were not growing anymore. And while we were growing, as artists, personally, we, we were kept within the, the the capsule of what is what, what is expected of Palestinian artists to yeah. do, the political yeah. art thing. So we went into an, an exercise of as a group we called it New Vision uh, to 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 try and uh, go on with our arts, uh, and and that's where the huge shift happened in in the way of presentation and representation in the arts. Is this uh, where- a lot, of, a lot of the artists, three of the artists say that they, it, it was also very, very deliberate thinking to use, um, to use the, natural, the natural materials instead of buying materials from Israel because there was a call for boycott of, of Israeli mm-hmm. materials. Yeah. Vera, I had a question on Edward Said and representation. And I am going to cut that quote short because of time, but I felt it was very relevant given that the occupation is ongoing, particularly what's happening today with the Palestinian landscape. So if I may read it quickly. He, it, on the exhausted Palestinian landscape, Edward Said in, 19, in 1986, he said, We always have to work with an already worked over space. We too have lost sense of space. We think of Palestine not as an extensive Palestinian state, but as a small, extremely congested piece of land of which we've been pushed. Every effort we take to retain the identity is also an effort to get back to the map. But the map, like the land itself, or like the walls or the houses, is already so saturated and cluttered that we have we have had to get used to work with an already worked over space. And I'm just wondering about this working with such an exhausted landscape, a landscape that's already worked over. Do you think your representation as an artist has changed? Do you feel that the nostalgia you had for Yafa has changed? Is it the same way you would represent it or you would represent home or identity or belonging? And yeah, as you speak, definitely. I want to share uh, the screen as you're replying. Yeah. Yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, my 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 art has shifted so dramatically with my awareness of how important. I mean, I didn't shift. For, I didn't stop using ceramics and clay, but I shifted and started using installation art to to send strong messages uh, about, about how, how things are, as, as Edward Said was saying, affecting our homes, affecting our environment, the space we live in. This is an installation at the Palestine Museum in, in uh, Birzeit. And I called it home. Sorry. And I called it home and I, it was part of a, a project on Jerusalem. I looked once at the picture seeing a woman in, in the old city of Jerusalem standing by her stair, staircase and looking up towards settlers who have positioned themselves in the house, they've taken the house above her and they use the steps every day to go up and down. So I put these steps as a symbol of, of the occupation of your own space and how it becomes narrow and caged in by, by, by the, the, what's happening in Jerusalem and other places of taking over and, and, and restricting the, the movement, restricting the life, the proper life of the inhabitants. But these steps that I made penetrate the cube and they go up. So I have hope that uh, one day 
things will change. We will be able to go in the steps and not the settlers. Inshallah. And, and the, other, the other installation, this one came, this is more recent. Uh, I, I was doing painting. I painted several uh, landscape paintings and collages on very long Japanese uh, paper. And I made so many of them, like eight, nine, nine long from memory, the landscape from memory. And they all looked so idyllic and so beautiful and so, so poetic, you know. And then I stopped and I said, but the landscape of Palestine has been invaded by so many armies and by so many civilizations. Uh, and they trod on the land, they walked on the landscape, they destroyed the landscape. And most recently is the uh, Israeli army is destroying the landscape. So I made several helmets to represent the different warriors and the different uh, and armies that walked through Palestine. I called it Warriors Passed By Here and, and I made it in 2019. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Nice. There's one of them which represents the Israeli army, but I can't see it very well from here now. Yeah. I... Shukran, Vera. And if we go back also to your teaching as a career, we're talking about art and education, and you've had such an amazing imprint in education. And now I'm talking as your student. As a tutor, probably you're the first who taught us what it means to bring in the personal subjective experience to become part of that collective narrative. Can you tell us more about your career? How did it start? And I will share. A... I started very early on in 1967, the first day of the June War. I was going to my first appointment at that women's training center. These are the girls that I met. And, and uh, with, which is an, an, a college a, a, a training uh, school for teachers who to become teachers. My students were to become arts, art teachers and they had, they were so angry because uh, they were placed in, in the art section. They didn't want to become art teachers. They didn't have the interest, they didn't have the background, but the challenge was great for me. And I developed a beautiful relationship. We did a lot of experimental work. My approach, in the beginning, I never thought I would become a teacher. I never in my life thought I would become a teacher. Mm. And then as I came in, in, to encounter these young women who came from Gaza, from Tulkarim, from Kalkilia, they were all refugee girls. Mm. And they all had such sharaf, uh, this passion to learn. Uh, in the beginning, they didn't want to learn, but I told them, listen, you are not going to become artists. I'm not making you artists, but you have. I'm, make, I'm hoping that you will become human beings who are sensitive to children's need and you can direct them to what's beauty around them, to, to be aware of the nature around them, to be aware of, of appreciating the, the colors, to appreciate. So, which you've reflected the last came to as well. Huh? Which you've reflected a lot also in your work in Birzeit University, yes, this yes, passion yes. to nature and materiality and texture and back to the senses as well. De definitely. Mm -hmm. And I and this is where I went in the no, I met please can you go, go back to the first picture? Sorry. Please? And this is where on the right hand side there's a picture of the students and I when we went to the villages to study to study the crafts, the Palestinian crafts. And it was amazing. We spent, the principal was very understanding. She gave us two months of our time, our project, to study this craft so that they can relay them to the younger people in, in, the, in the little in the camps, in the, in the villages where they came from. So we did pottery, we did basket weaving, we did uh, rug weaving in Samoa, we went to Samoa, and a lot of things. And these girls were recording and drawing and coming back to make things inspired by the trips. So it was very, very interesting. What do you mean? In Birzeit, again, it, I, I, there was no art program at Birzeit. Uh, I, was, I, came, uh, I came to Birzeit after I finished my degree at Oxford and uh, I, I started developing the courses on is, in Islamic art history and architecture. And I started developing a course in art history at the Department of Architecture where Rara studied. 
And another course, which was called the visual communication course, which is amazing, amazing. It's, it was a relationship, some symbiotic relationship with the students. I was learning as I was going along. I mean, it was an exceptional, exceptional uh, uh, relationship of learning and, and giving, learning and giving. And, the, and if I may say, it was the first also experiment probably for students of architecture then, which was more engineering driven for students to experiment and test uh, things out. That was our first encounter, which made it very unique because it sets the basis for conceptual thinking. That was really- Exactly, unique. exactly. And it was at the time, in the beginning, it was at the time where, where the installation art and conceptual art was starting. So I started introducing these projects to the students. I introduced a lot of artists, international artists to the students. We had Samia Halabi come and share her expertise in a, in a workshop uh, with the students. It was a very rich uh, time for me and, and I feel for the students and I feel it now because Yara, Yara I, I almost sometimes I have tears in my eyes when I think about how many students stop me in the streets and tell me how much they enjoyed these courses and how much they learned in these courses. Absolutely. And, and I, I don't want to brag, but a lot of the students who are architects have now taken up position in big and in establishing in art, art and cultural institutions in, in Qatan Foundation, in Al Hosh, in Sekakini, uh, as teachers. So I, be, I feel very proud. So I introduced conceptual art while we were doing a lot of other studies to know, to understand color and shape and the fundamentals of design. And on the left, on the right hand side is a, is a project by students about the Madrid conference. They had, um, they had these people sitting with Coca-Cola bottles. That was a very cynical, it was so well done. Uh, they brought in mannequins and dressed them up in different clothes representing uh, the different leaders at the time. It was very- so I thought it was very nice how you introduced a lot of times this kind of personal experience, but also brought irony into the work, especially when discussing political issues. But I also recall when we were young, then how we addressed these aspects of the chair, the seating, how simple notions, simple concepts started to discuss the bigger landscape similar to this installation that we're looking at now, but that was the beauty and the creativity of Vera, that really she, we kind of started with very small observations and these small observations became concepts and these concepts became then the bigger projects that stayed with us until today. So I, if I may say, we're very proud of you being a tutor, uh, Vera, because you really, your imprint has, is, its impact is ongoing now. And we should just look at El Qattan or Riwak or Sakia and many other cultural organizations where we're all taught uh, through you, Vera. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank you, my students, for being these this kind of very intelligent, very receptive, very loving students. It's you. I, I mean, I think I think without you, I mean, you're my treasure in life. I really, this is better than all the artwork that I did in my life. <laughs> it's, the, it's the seeds you're planted really, Vera. It's the generosity that I still learn from as well as a tutor myself. So thank you for that. Uh, Vera, may I uh, move also to Birzeit Museum? And such an idea, such a something kind of like first of its kind, a contemporary approach, a very timely initiative that happened. Tell us a bit about it. Why a museum? Why in Birzeit? Why was it important at the time? Uh, you know, I was the, the, the art teacher at Birzeit. I was the only one teaching art, in fact. And uh, there was a time when, when Birzeit was receiving, uh, especially after the Oslo Accord, when people had hope and peace and stuff like that. The first, the first uh, they started giving gifts, art gifts to, and, and uh, other things to the, to the university as a tribute for the long history of Birzeit as an educational institution that has graduated so many very important people and kept the education going in Palestine for all these young men and women who became, who up till now are, it's one of the best 
universities and the most prestigious in, 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 in Palestine, the oldest. It was established in 1924. And the art and culture was ingrained since it was established. In Birzeit, they had concerts, they had drama, they had music, they had theater, they had a lot of a lot of cultural activities going on, even way back in the 20, 30s and 40s. Uh, so when I came, actually, there was, Birzeit was in a time when it was in transition uh, from being a small college into a university and and the, it was the occupation. There was no time to to give the no time to give attention to the to the development of the arts at Birzeit University. So when I was teaching these courses, they the and and the gifts started coming in. I was handed the responsibility of looking after. So I became by default a museum person, mm. and I became a curator by default, and I became interested in all these things. So. The first present was by, um, uh, by René Ferrer and a Swiss artist, very famous Swiss artist who, as a tribute to Palestine, decided to give uh, six of his huge monumental abstract paint, minima, minimalist paintings to be received. And uh, then after that, uh, Marwan Qasab uh, gave 75 of his uh, works to be received, a whole group of works. Uh, uh, in, under the name for the children of Palestine, and Samia Halabi, Kamal Bullata, a lot of people started giving all as a tribute for the for Birzit as being a higher education. So when we, and then uh, there was also a, a wonderful collection of costumes that the university had bought at one point. And the most important was the, the amulet collection done by uh, by Tafi Kanan, Dr. Tafi Kanan from 1905, who was a physician. And he he collected, can I see the slide after that, please? Yes, Dr. Kanan uh, made a huge uh, collection of amulets, a very rare collection in the world. And his family decided to also donate this wonderful collection that was kept in hiding in 1948. For, for until 1967, it was kept in hiding, and then the family decided that they would give it to Birzeit. So in the 1980s, they gave it to uh, Birzeit University, and, and it's a huge collection of 1,400 pieces, yeah. all documented and talking about the traditions of, uh, of and beliefs of uh, um, in, in, as, in the use of am, amulets against the jinn for health purposes. Amazing place, which is now being promoted uh, by the, still by the museum. We made a wonderful little exhibition for the opening and invited the family, the Canaan family to come um, mm -hmm. in 1996, I, I believe. It, mm -hmm. It's an amazing collection. We're very proud to have it. And we have it open for research. I mean, now the, there's the uh, Dr. Rana Barakat who's directing the museum at Birzeit and she's, she's conducting a series of uh, workshops around the, the the, the collection. Mm -hmm. We have a costume collection, an art collection, a beautiful art collection, donated also, all donated by the artists, Palestinian artists. Uh, we, I, we curated lovely exhibitions. It was the, the first space, in fact, to hold properly curated exhibitions uh, in Palestine uh, as a space, as a museum space. And the, the there was a lot of interest of pe people coming in to attend. attend, and it's, The Bizet University Museum was started as a, an academic museum so that people will be able to interact and learn. Within the curated exhibitions that I did was a series called the Cities Exhibitions. And the, this picture is from the Ramallah exhibition. We had a, 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 an exhibition called Ramallah, the fairest of them all. And uh, we did an exhibition about the social life in Ramallah. And what was also interesting, for the first time, I had with my colleague, uh, Yazid Anani, uh, we decided to have also uh, part of our presentations in the public space in Ramallah itself. So people could join in the streets of Ramallah, the different uh, installations that we had. This is an installation inside the museum 
were dummies that were cutouts of people in the manara, taken from pictures of people standing in the manara with the manara, which is the center of town behind them. Hello. And I remember the beauty of that exhibition in the sense that we started also as students to rethink what is a public space in Palestine and blur that boundary between interior exterior. So it was very nicely well fit within that scope of architecture. Vera, we the, have in the, sorry, Manish, in this in the second exhibition we had after the Ramallah, the third exhibition, it was in Nablus. And uh, it was actually all in the public space in, in the souks ah. of the old city of Nablus. And it was amazing. I because recall it, it, uh, because it, it, in, in, we integrated our works with the with the souk, with the with the soap factory, with the mill, with all these places, uh, to, and, 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 and the, the train station also. It was also a very, very fascinating experience. Hello. There I'm aware of time. We have around 10 minutes. So I wanted you to kindly talk about this uh, briefly, the virtual gallery, given its importance and uh, uniqueness at the time. And then maybe we could go to your lovely books, Returning and Intimate Reflections. Uh, and then afterwards, we can allow some questions and answers by the audience. Would that be OK? Yes. So very quickly, while as a teacher, I was aware, and as establishing a, a little museum, a museum at Beirut University, I was aware of how little access people have to art because of the different boundaries and the checkpoints and the mobility issues. And so, I, although I'm not an, 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 an IT person or involved in technology, I, I was thinking there must be a way of using the computer to mm. introduce art to the Palestinians within Palestine and outside Palestine to integrate the experiences of Palestinians. So we did, we had a great, great grant, grant from the uh, Palestine Telecommunications, telephone uh, company, and uh, we established uh, this website. Which uh, year was that, Vera? It must have been in uh, 2005. Okay. Mm. Or maybe a little earlier, to, between 2004 and and it con I, I forgot exactly the, the time, but it was within, in, in that time. And it was uh, very, very interesting because we, a lot of people were, were helped with this course, primarily T Tina Sherwood, who designed the program itself. Tina was uh, uh, involved in, the, in, in establishing the Art Academy in, in Palestine. And uh, she helped with the programming, making the program, building the, the, the I don't know what they call it, the port and different things in the in the the mapping of the of the the, the, the virtual gallery. So every month we had fixed features, artists of the month, exhibitions, and, and we did a lot of and it became a wonderful reference for everybody. Unfortunately, after some years, after I left. The technology developed. There was no time, not enough money to continue with the project. So it stopped this, there. It's being it's being posted online, but it had stopped uh, some 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 time ago. Feeding but at that, that, at that time, a virtual platform was really unique and original, which wasn't there yet uh, in Palestine. So it really set up a fantastic platform, which was also an archival platform for Palestinians to... Uh, exactly. Learn. A lot of people have been telling me, have told me all along how how much they'd used the virtual gallery, because it was the only such a platform in, in for Palestine and in Palestine, in the Arab world, in fact. And it was very innovative in its approach. We wanted to do a, a 3D, like they're doing now, 3D gallery, so that people can go actually walk in the, the space, the museum space at Birze. We did a lot of experimentation, but it was a huge project and it needed staff and money. If what we did, we did. It was very, very important at the time. <laughs> Still is very important, Vera. May I, Vera, move to two of your beautiful, uh, two beautiful publications, Intimate Reflections, published by Abdel Mohsen Qattan, and also Returning, that we would like 
to also elaborate a bit more about it. So could you tell us a bit on intimate reflection and then we could go more it in was, detail? It was really, frankly, an initiative by an ex-student of mine, Yazid Anani, with whom I collaborate often. He's, he's a director of activities at the Qatan Foundation, does amazing works, very inspiring young man. And, Always. Uh, and uh, really, I'm very, I'm very proud of this kind of relationship with uh, Yazid as an ex-student, a colleague, and a person with whom we can share ideas. So uh, Yazid was thinking in a, in a funny way. He said, I don't know why all these men artists are having books being published and not, not a single book for Vera Tamari in, mm -hmm. in Palestine. Where, when you have, when, you, when we can talk a lot about your career and stuff like that as a record of, of what, what, what happened. So he initiated this and it was really very, I was very moved by this act. Uh, and so we did the book and it was written by, by nine different people on nine different aspects of my career as artist, as teacher. And there's a, and there's a chapter with my sister, Tanya. I mean, this, is, this picture is from that chapter where during the corona, we interacted uh, through emails and we published our emails talking about our upbringing, talking about art, talking about different things. So it was like a, a dialogue uh, through email. So this is a picture of the three of us as young kids in that chapter. We talk a lot about my upbringing. And the second picture is my, my parents and my family uh, in Amman. Jamila Amman. And I think what was beautiful about the book is the uh, generosity of all the contributors, which also reflects your generosity, Vera. People felt very uh, uh, passionate about writing about you, about your creativity, and the way they also viewed it from their own perspective, which was really insightful. So please do look at the book because it's absolutely worth uh, the read. And maybe we will, uh, Vera, end with uh, return, return, uh, uh, return maybe with its positive sense, with its hopeful sense. Returning is the hopeful narration of Palestine, which Vera offered us vignettes of Palestinian life through the medium of art, a very beautiful book. Can you, Vera, tell us a bit more about this? And we start with this lovely gentleman. Uh, who it is, is it? it was this book was created during the also the COVID years and actually no it it, it started through a pro, an art project that I did in the eighties where I took uh, pictures from my father's archive photographic archive he was this is my father as a young man handsome good looking and he was very much interested in photography as an amateur I mean he's not a professional photographer but he collected a lot of photographs he, that he took himself or he collected from elsewhere. And I was very, all the time we had these photographs, thank God we have these photographs as a reference to a life of an urban Palestinian family in Jaffa and Jerusalem and, and the different activities that these families uh, carried on in their normal daily life. In addition to other photographs that my father took about the, the, the war, the mandate, the conflict, the different strats, the, 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 especially the Nakba. Uh, so I was fascinated by how the Palestinian community in Jaffa was a unified community. They were all doing their own mm. things, their everyday things, going to school every day, going to work, waking up, sitting on the balcony. This, the daily rhythm of life was suddenly interrupted in 1948. But what we have as a family, we had this photograph to remind us of some people and what they were doing. So I, I made a series of uh, re clay release from these photographs. Like this one is from, after a picture of my mother standing in her father's house in Jaffa, Margot the Bess. She was a young woman before she got married. Uh, I made an installation after that, developing the, that theme. I'm, I'm not talking about it more. She was very romantic, my mother, and uh, was very well read in, the romantic literature of the French uh, uh, French writers Lamartine and Hugo, and <clears throat> so I made I made this series of of uh, of uh, release, uh, 
And while I was doing them, I felt there's a huge, amazing, unexplainable link with the family members, whom I, most of whom I don't know, but I know by name. So I, I, I felt this, this kind of continuity, despite of the interruption in 1948, that it was necessary for me to do this, this project. So I did these things. In this last one, there's me sitting with my hands like that. My cousin Salim is on the side of the bicycle. My mother, Margot, and my, my aunt Marie, and Tanya, my sister, who's with us tonight. She's probably looking. So this is a picture that we took in Beirut right after the Hijra, right after the, uh, the Nakba. We were, we were going there to visit my aunts and uncles who had fled Jaffa and settled in Lebanon. So uh, I write this. Then eventually I started doing the, the reliefs and I started writing little bits about each picture. I wrote about two pictures and then I stopped. During the COVID, I thought it's a, it's a project that I had in mind and I continued it. And I wrote 10 stories and that's how returning came about. Returning in memory and, and in life in, through these uh, stories to, to Palestine. Shukran Vera for a really inspiring and it's what's really beautiful about the book is that there was a lot of discussion always about how before the Nakba there wasn't much documentation of everyday life in Palestine because we didn't realize what was coming up so what was beautiful about this book is that it's not only about displacement but it's really about remembrance and renewal and that's what it managed to capture which is something we're really desperate for so thank you for the beauty of this book uh, yes, I mean yeah. I feel I feel like if many people manage to to write stories very simple stories I'm not a writer myself but they came in naturally when I was writing and and it's things that I picked up from memory from what my parents said about different people and anecdotes sad stories uh, about how they fled Jaffa how they you know or or Jerusalem and and the stories came in very naturally and uh, very simply and uh, some of them are very poignant and and uh, moving when I read them I feel moved so uh, I hope you you will get a chance to read read the book or have a copy of the book. It's being circulated. It's, I don't know. It's being sold here in Palestine. It will be sold in Beirut, and we're working on the Arabic edition. Unfortunately, it hasn't been published yet. We couldn't agree with the publisher, so it will be this year, inshallah. Shukran Vera. Vera, I, I, uh, first I wanted to thank you for such an inspiring talk and very enjoyable. And I'm looking at the thread of conversation in the chat box and they're all beautiful messages to you. So before we end, I know that you wanted to read a bit of an extract from your book. This is called Picnic in Hebron. And I wrote about my father in this uh, story, in this chapter, I wrote about my father who was employed by the British mandate in Hebron. He is a young man from Jaffa, um, uh, very handsome, well-dressed. And he was, I, I don't know how he was perceived and accepted in the more conservative, and he had a very wild life in Jaffa. And he was, was conceived as a charming, uh, very well-dressed, uh, elegant person walking in the streets of uh, Hebron, which was more conservative <clears throat> in its nature. So I'm going to be reading a passage which comes at the end of this chapter uh, uh, <clears throat> about, my, about uh, a certain relationship that my father and uh, his family developed with another family in, in Hebron. Over the years, my father had developed a very close friendship with the Hebronite Jewish family, the Mannies. Eli Manny was my father's best friend. He was a young physician and the same age as my father. My father's friendship with Eli was interrupted in 1948 with the Nakba and the dramatic separation between the Palestinian Arabs and the Palestinian Jews. Jewish Palestinian families moved to the area now occupied and designated as Israel, and contact between the two communities in the divided areas totally stopped. Father always talked to us of this pain of separation. Eli was not only a friend, he was, as our birth certificates attest, 
the physician who delivered the three of us, Tanya, Vladimir, and myself, at the Mascobia Government Hospital in Jerusalem prior to 1948. A reunion with Eli occurred 19 years later, after the June 1967 war, when Israel occupied the rest of Palestine, the West Bank and Gaza, which had been ruled the, the, the West Bank by the, Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Shortly after the fall and occupation of the West Bank by Israel, Father received a message from Eli Mani asking about our welfare as a family and whether we were in need of any help. Father's response to that kind gesture from his old time friend, best friend, was filled with much emotion and appreciation. When the situation eventually calmed, we exchanged family visits. Access to us as Palestinians to visit West Jerusalem, where Eli and his family took residence after leaving Hebron in 1948, had become easier for us. We took that trip to Jerusalem with mixed emotions. In reality, the Manis were now the enemy. They belonged to an occupying regime who deprived us Palestinians of our nationhood in 1948 and again became our occupiers in 1967. Yet father could not ignore that Eli had once been his closest friend and with whom he had shared a deep bond during their young adulthood. The Mani house was in the affluent Rehavia neighborhood of West Jerusalem. A little sadness overcame us as the car drove through the different streets. We passed villas and two-story houses surrounded by lush gardens and tall trees. This is what a Jerusalem Palestinian neighborhood would have looked like before 1948. Now Israeli families lived there instead of their original residents. We were met with great warmth by Eli and his wife, Bruria. Tea and cakes were served, but Bruria kept enumerating with pride the wonderful things the new state of Israel offered them without paying much attention to our feelings. Eli sat quietly while he and father occasionally exchanged sad glances as they undoubtedly recalled old times when they all had, had lived without this tragic divide that left them, these two special friends, as occupier and occupied. As we stood up to leave, a young woman and a young man in military fatigues walked in to greet us. They were the teenage son and daughter of Eli and Bruria who were serving the obligatory military service in the Israeli army. Dumbstruck, we politely but awkwardly left the Manny house. Not much contact took place after that visit. It was a day in 1980 when I answered the phone to hear Dr. Manny's voice on the other line. It was shortly after my father had passed away. He was calling to express his sympathy and offer condolences at our loss and his loss too. His voice and mind became stifled with sobs over the phone. Not much was said, but I knew and felt that despite the tragic separation and the sad fate of Fags and Elise's friendship, there was a deep bond that always remained of their friendship in Hebron, warmly protected in a corner of both their hearts. That's the story. Shukran Iktir Vera, very touching, very beautiful. And I, I really would like just to end by saying thank you very much for your gentle and yet firm approach to narrate Palestine and make us visible with this amazing art, work of art. 